I was asked to talk about blood as a source of EVs. And since this is an education day, I hope you forgive me if I start with the very basics, like we have the whole blood and as you all know, if we subject it to a brief centrifugation after dilution, we end up with plasma, the red blood cells at the bottom and the buffy coat in between as a layer, which is composed of leukocytes and platelets. And the ratios is 55% approximately one or even less percentage and 45% of the red blood cells. And then when we look at plasma, we find that 7% 7, 7 of plasma is constituted by proteins, vast majority is water, and, and we have 2% representing other solutes. And if we just focus on the proteins, we find that 58% is albumin, 38% is constituted by globulins, and we have 4% fibrinogen. And this is a well-known uh, electrophoretic uh, diagram where, where you find the albumin and the globulin peaks. And this is how we can teach students how to easily remember the histogram. Uh, in the peripheral blood smear, uh, you recognize red blood cells, platelets, and the different leukocytes, eosinophil granulocyte, neutrophil granulocyte, basophil cell, lymphocyte, monocyte. And when it comes to the question from among these blood components, what's the real source of EVs in the circulation? I would like to start with, with the so-called intravascular sources. So these are, in fact, the blood cells. And to the best of our understanding, they are responsible for the vast majority of, of the circulating uh, extracellular vesicles. So these include the platelet-derived vesicles, the red blood cell-derived vesicles, the adaptive immune cell-derived vesicles, like T-cell, B-cell-derived vesicles, and the innate immune cell-derived vesicles, such as those released by my monocytes or NK cells. And we should not forget about one last intravascular component, endothelial cell-derived EVs. But there are also extravascular sources of circulating EVs, even though their uh, percentage or frequency is not that high in the circulation. We may have bacteria and perhaps we have viruses as well, we sometimes find cancer-derived vesicles. Uh, we can find other organ-derived vesicles like liver-derived vesicles. There is evidence that, for example, in chronic liver disease, uh, liver cell-derived vesicles find their way to the circulation. So there's evidence that placenta-derived vesicles find their way to the circulation. And uh, we and others have found that cardiomyocyte derived vesicles can reach the circulation as well. And these are just examples for non uh, blood cell derived uh, vesicles representing different organs. I would like to point out uh, some hints how we can recognize these intravascular cell derived circulating EVs. For example, uh, for platelets, we have uh, tools like CD61. Uh, uh, to recognize the platelet-derived vesicles. And the activated platelet-derived vesicles can be recognized by, uh, by identifying P-selectin on their surface. Uh, the red blood cell-derived vesicles can be distinguished by their expression of glycophorin A, CD 235A. Uh, we can uh, look for CD45 as a leukocyte common antigen for leukocyte-derived vesicles. We can identify the granulocyte derived vesicles by the expression or the presence of CD66B, or monocyte derived vesicles by the presence of CD14 on their surface, or endothelial cell derived vesicles by, by E selecting CD62E on their surface. When it comes to the non, non uh, intravascular, that is, extravascular cell derived circulating EVs, for, for placenta-derived EVs, you can use HLAG or uh, placental alkaline phosphatase as a marker. Uh, we can identify bacteria by the presence of LPS as shown by the group of Van Hendricks. Uh, we can identify tumor cell-derived uh, uh, vesicles by their surface expression of certain molecules like EPCAM or MAGE36. Uh, uh, 
and there are many other examples, uh, we can identify hepatocyte-derived vesicles and cardiomyocyte-derived vesicles. In the last case, I, I would like to point out that the troponin marker is inside the vesicle, so you have to permeabilize the vesicular membrane before you are able to demonstrate the presence of troponin. And then uh, when we look at the, the circulation particle uh, population inside the blood plasma, we realize that there are many <clears throat> circulating non-extracellular vesicle particles there. I would start with the lipoproteins. We have heard about them in the talk of RINC. Indeed, they include uh, the, the GI tract derived chylomicrons uh, represented or recognized by the presence of ApoB48. And we have VLDL, IDL, and LDL populations, all three having ApoB100 associated with the lipid moiety. And we have HDL. And these uh, lipoproteins, the last ones, VLDL, IDL, LDL, and HDL are all derived from the liver and they are very numerous in our circulation. We have to remember that we have protein complexes like immune complexes and protein aggregates in the circulation. And recent understanding uh, demonstrated the presence of little, little particles like exomeres or supermeres uh, which are most probably present in the circulation, it is challenging to, to demonstrate them in this protein-rich matrix though, but, but for sure, since there's a hope that they carry a lot of uh, relevant information, there will be lots of efforts to, to specifically purify them from plasma. And when it comes to these circulating non-EV particles, this is just to show you that uh, their relative proportion is several orders of magnitude higher than that of EVs. So we have uh, several orders of magnitude higher uh, concentration of different lipoprotein particles as compared to EVs. A recent study uh, demonstrated uh, the percentage of, of uh, different cell-derived vesicles uh, showing a somewhat surprising result. Uh, according to this last, uh, last publication that has been published in the Journal of Extracellular Biology recently, uh, the authors uh, um, suggested that there are 30% platelet-derived vesicles, uh, only 5% red blood cell-derived vesicles, and a very large number of uh, immune cell-derived vesicles present in the circulation. This approach that they used in their study is based on published data, but not on, on vesicle surface associated protein recognition, but rather on the vesicle associated RNA signature. Using this approach, they, they showed that, or they suggested that there are twofold uh, excess of vesicles compared to cells in the circulation. And I think this example shows you very clearly that that uh, when you compare different publications, uh, we have to realize that we still have to, to learn a lot. It's a long way. Uh, we, we still do not have a consensus about even this simplest uh, question, what is the source of different uh, vesicle populations? Because when, when people look at the, the protein-based, uh, uh, marker-based uh, vesicle populations, the vast majority, like um, above 50% or at least 50% of vesicles come from platelets. And for sure enough, uh, red blood cell derived vesicles are estimated much higher than this. The authors of this uh, previously mentioned publication in JX Bio even uh, suggested that monocytes are the most active producers of vesicles, whereas the red blood cells are the ones which produce the least amount of uh, vesicles. Uh, I think further studies will uh, decide whether these this results hold true or the previous results, which are based on surface uh, markers of EVs. And now uh, there's another question I would like to talk about. That is, what kind of EVs are there in the blood? Earlier, we thought uh, the question was very simple. We had exosomes and plasma membrane-derived vesicles, <coughs> exosome. 
which seem to be relatively simple to classify like microvesicles or large apoptotic bodies, but our recent understanding showed us that there are many different types of ectosomes also uh, uh, in the extracellular vesicle family. And I think uh, there's an increasing attention paid to these non-conventional uh, vesicle types. In the next few slides, I would like to show you a couple of examples how interesting vesicles there are in the circulation. Thank you very much. So uh, when talking about plates that derive DVs, I would like to start that uh, megakaryocytes in the bone marrow give rise to these protruded proplatelets uh, from which uh, the shear stress releases the actual platelets. And both these megakaryocytes and the platelets will give rise to vesicles. Platelets particularly release vesicles if they are activated. And these vesicles are released uh, to the bloodstream and, and we can detect them over there. The platelet-derived vesicles have a couple of markers that help us to identify them, like GP2B, GP3A, CD41, CD61, C-type lectin, um, uh, P-selectin. And also I have to mention that, that uh, these uh, vesicles have been previously uh, in many studies associated with procoagulant function and uh, their uh, preferential association with the surface of monocytes and granulocytes have been demonstrated by several authors. I would like to also add that these platelet EVs are amazing little antigen presenting units. They contain proteasomes and uh, up an uptake of proteins they can present it with MHC1 to CD8 positive T cells, and they even carry co-stimulatory molecules on their surface. So they are functioning as professional antigen presenting units have been demonstrated. Uh, there are very interesting long platelet derived uh, structures referred to as flippers. These are platelet-derived flow-induced protrusions, which you can appreciate based on these nice scanning electron microscopic images. And uh, their length is up to 250 micrometers, which is amazing. They are really long and their formation is obviously shear dependent and it requires cyclo cyclophilin D, kalpa in our REC1 uh, activation. And it has been demonstrated that uh, phagocytic cells like monocytes or polymorpho polymorphonuclear uh, neutrophil granulocytes roll over these long processes and they take bites. They, they take uh, little fragments as microparticles and upon uptaking these platelet-derived microparticles, monocytes and neutrophils become activated. Red blood cell derived vesicles. They also carry on their surface marker molecules I already mentioned, like a foreign A, CD 235A. But also, I would like to point uh, to the presence of N3 protein on the uh, surface of red blood cell derived vesicles. And within the vesicles, you find denatured hemoglobin and also carbonic anhydrase which could be also markers once the membrane of the vesicle is permeabilized. In an old paper from 2013 of Alain Brisson's group, uh, we know that there are numerous blood plasma derived tubular vesicles. And as you can see, many of these tubular vesicles are actually of erythrocyte uh, origin. Uh, in this study, uh, immune gold electron microscopy was carried out and those little black dots along this tubular structure are all uh, immune labeled glycophorin A molecules. It was also shown in this study that this tubular structure ultimately fragment and form vesicles. How about the neutrophil derived vesicles? They are not only conventional exosomes, that is endosomal derived vesicles and plasma membrane derived ectosomes and apoptotic bodies, but we know that there are some special types of vesicles released by these cells, the ants, the cytoplasts, and microsomes and mitosomes. Ants are elongated structures. As neutrophils roll on the surface of the endothelial cell, they leave behind very long extended cytoplasmic processes. 
structures, which are uh, fragmented to these uh, tubular structures. These are what we refer to as ends. Ultimately, they will round up and they will be uptaken by other cells. So neutrophils on the surface of endothelial cells leave behind these elongated structures, which first fragment into elongated ends, and they will form at the end uh, spherical structures. And it has been demonstrated that in certain conditions, like in sepsis, the formation of these ends is really upregulated like 100 fold. What is the cytoplasm? Uh, once uh, neutrophils undergo netosis, that is the, the release of the nucleic acids, there's one type of, of uh, netosis which is called non-suicidal netosis. When the nucleic acid content at least partially is released and what remains behind is, is a, a non-conventional large structure called cytoplasm, which in the broad sense could be considered as a huge extracellular vesicle. However, it retains its ability to migrate and even to phagocytose. So it's debatable whether we can list this as a, an uh, extracellular vesicle or not. And I would like to finally point to the trophoblast-derived EVs because among them, we again find some unconventional ones. These are the syncytial nuclear aggregates or syncytial knots, which are really large and they have special markers and they are characteristic of the trophoblast surface. Uh, the fourth question I would like to just very briefly touch upon, do all EVs in the blood have a corona? And you heard a lot uh, from Rink already about the, the, the corona around the surface of vesicles. And I would like to add that, yes, absolutely. As soon as the vesicles are released either from the endosomal compartment or released from the, the cell surface, they necessarily uh, form a corona around them. And this corona is dynamic. Maybe if there are some higher affinity binders in different uh, compartments, they can be partially replaced. But yes, there are no naked uh, vesicles without a corona in the blood. And finally, since this is an education day, I would like to, to uh, show you a flashcard, a memo card of some factors that determine plasma EV signatures. So we have to consider that whether a person is sick or healthy uh, determines the plasma EV signature. Also, the age is known to, to matter. We know that there are uh, uh, gender related differences, at least in the cargo of the vesicles in the bloodstream. We have to consider the postprandial or preprandial status of the sample. And not just because uh, the postprandial uh, plasma might contain large amounts of chiromicrons, but also because um, hyperlipoproteinemia uh, can, can um, induce liver cell derived vesicle release into the circulation and might even interfere with the vesicle uptake. So uh, all in all, uh, high levels of circulating lycoproteins can release or can induce uh, uh, higher levels of extracellular vesicles. Um, uh, we have to consider that there are already quite a few publications that demonstrate that exercise, physical exercise induces uh, extracellular vesicle uh, increase in the circulation. This is something we have to consider. And recently it was demonstrated that even in the dark light cycles have an impact on the vesicle concentration. And then, uh, as you know, these are the classical parameters. When we collect the cubital vein blood, the, the pressure by which we compress the upper arm uh, does make a difference. What kind of needle we use for blood sampling, what kind of tubes we use, whether it's a glass or plastic tube, we know it from from rings work, uh, what anticoagulants we use in this, in this uh, uh, processing, uh, whether the anticoagulant co coagulant blocks the release, the in vitro release of vesicles by platelet and non-platelet EVs or not, and whether, uh, whether these, these vesicles, platelet-derived vesicles, uh, increase the number of, of the detected vesicles in blood plasma. 
And then we have to also consider whether we discard or keep the last drops, or the, not the last, the first drops uh, of, the, of the blood sample that we have taken, how fast we process the sample, the, how long the sample sits on the laboratory bench, uh, whether we have to transport the vesicles, uh, whether there is some uh, gender uh, shaking, uh, whether the, the technician walks with it or whether it's transported by car. So vibration might uh, induce the release of vesicles. We all know that. How many times we centrifuge the samples to deplete in, in platelets and, and freeze thawing is very crucial in, in determining the ultimate EV signatures. So this is a very <laughs> simple, but but maybe uh, easy to memorize a summary of the uh, pre-analytical conditions one has to consider. And with that, I would like to thank your for your attention. I will look forward to your questions. Thank you. Um, something that I've seen in the literature and don't really understand how they know is kind of like they'll say platelets don't release EVs unless they're activated. Is that like a zero to 100 or is there a gradient of they do release some but when they're activated they release so many more yeah so i think uh, activation is a, such a strong stimulus of ev release that probably several orders of magnitude higher number of vesicles are detached from the surface i cannot exclude that there is some release uh, even in in resting condition but for sure enough an ag agonist uh, derived activation gives a very strong boost Okay, but you think that they could release some? Yeah, I, I would say yes, based on the fact that the, the nucleus-free red blood cells also release vesicles. Yeah, well, but it depends on, on the condition, how, how many vesicles. And you have seen in this uh, paper that I, I mentioned from JX Bio that probably there is a very wide spectrum. Yeah, it just seems free. like it's such a part of the life cycle, like any cell's life cycle to release some EVs in some manner that to say that they don't release any until activated. I've seen I that for- I think it's very, very hard to prove that there is no release at all. Okay, thank you. Okay, it's mandatory yeah, checklist. Uh, my question is about the hemopoietic uh, stem cells, the uh, secretion of uh, blood EVs from their progenitor cells. So how is, Different between the mature versus uh, when they are at progenitor state, the rate of secretion or do their content differ during the maturation state, differentiation and the hemopo hemopoietosis? I'm not very sure I understand your question clearly, but since hematopoietic stem cells are, are very active cells, uh, they are known to release a lot of vesicles for sure. And if they are uh, for example, mobilize, immobilized from the bone marrow, then their, their vesicle release is in the blood plasma for sure. So they would contribute significantly. Yeah. To the blood. Because we saw the like markers for every cell type, but do we have specific markers for the their bef uh, before differentiation when they are released from the progenitor cells versus those released from the mature blood cells. You ask if there are some specific uh, um, stem cell markers. Yeah, markers are, yeah, we, we can dis distinguish that those guys are from the, yeah, early stage or from the mature stage. Yeah, I, I, I don't work with stem cells and I'm not personally experienced. Maybe somebody in the audience can help with that. Uh, I, I know that there are um, certain um, markers for, for stem cells. I don't know whether it has been looked at and, and if, if people try to identify those stem cell derived vesicles yet or not. A uh, really nice talk. I'd like to thank you for that, firstly. Um, my question is regarding um, circulating EVs, especially from cardiomyocytes. And you mentioned troponin, um, that you have to permeabilize the EVs to detect them. So talking about detection methods such as flow cytometry, I find it personally hard to normalize the data, especially if you're going to put it in the same panel as other like endothelial cell derived EVs, for example. Um, in your opinion, uh, what's your view on, for example, using other surface markers for cardiomyocytes such as cabulin 3, for example? So in our, in our approach, we try to identify cardiomyocyte derived uh, vesicles uh, by surface markers. And so far we were not successful. What we 
succeeded to do is to to have some transgenic double transgenic mice in which the 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 rest of the cells of the mouse were td tomato positive and only the cardiomyocytes were expressing gfp uh, under a cardiomyocyte uh, promoter and so the uh, green fluorescent vesicles in the blood circulation clearly showed to us that those are cardiomyocyte derived if we induce the systemic inflammation by LPS injection, and we demonstrated that it causes uh, uh, cardiac injury, we could demonstrate that the green fluorescent uh, vesicle number went up in the circulation. And when we looked at this population after permeabilization, we found that they were troponin positive. So that's why we concluded that they are there. But, but to be honest, in our hands, we don't have any cardiomyocyte derived uh, marker that is present in the circulation on the EVs. And that would show, show us that these are coming from the, the heart. And we have the final question up here. Thank you. Yeah, great talk. Um, it was a very similar question, actually, if you had some advice on how you go about permeabilizing the, the EVs, keeping them intact uh, for the, for the intra, intra EV uh, antibody staining, the, the cardiac troponin. So, so the, we, we use uh, saponin or, or twin 20 okay. uh, briefly to, to permeabilize them. And also sometimes, formaldehyde fixation works. So very brief formaldehyde fixation somehow opens up the membrane and it enables antibodies to get in. So similar techniques to permeabilizing cells? Absolutely, yeah. A bit more so, mild, I guess. Thank you, Edith, very much. It was a brilliant talk and a really nice introduction to our complex source. So let's give a hand to Edith.